So I want to share a story with you today. When I was a child, I remember my parents asking me what I wanted to become when I grew up. I should have said a doctor, an engineer, or perhaps even a pilot. But I remember saying very clearly that I wanted to become a giraffe. <laughs> yes, I feel so smart right now. Yes, a giraffe. Crazy, right? But as a child, you can be whatever and whoever you want to be. Your imagination and your creativity is limitless. But as you grow up, things change. You go to school and you get already boxed in. If you're sitting in the front row, you're the good kid. You say all the right things. You're the teacher's pet. Um, you put your hand up and you want to ask a question. But if you're sitting in the back, you're the bad kid. You always riot, you always say the wrong things, and I can see some of you already smiling. So I'm guessing a lot of back row kids here. And you hear things like, Nisanga, behave yourself. Don't speak out of turn. You shouldn't do that. You can't do that. And eventually, your inner voice changes, and you start saying things like, I can't, leading to a very conservative mindset. So what started off being a dream of becoming a giraffe, thankfully things changed, and I ended up becoming an engineer. And I know my parents must be very happy about that. But the dream of becoming imaginative and wanting to be creative never changed. I'm sick and tired of hearing this statement, which always goes like, that's how it's going to be. That's how it will always be. Don't fix it unless it's broken. Over the last couple of years, I've had the fortune of meeting a lot of entrepreneurs and startups, and they've told me some hilarious stories about what people told them when they said they are going to do a startup. So I'd like to share some of them. One of the first stories is they say, why do you want to leave a safe job and go and venture out and do, that, do something that nobody knows about? The second story is how some people, even some parents, say, why do you want to leave your corporate job and do your startup? You're not going to get EPF. And the last story is of how some parents say, why do you want to leave this reputed firm and go and do something that nobody knows about? What am I going to tell all the aunties and uncles when they ask where you're working? It sounds funny. But the truth is, this is our society, and this is a conservative mindset. And society is everywhere. They are in homes, offices, schools, running industries. And if this is how our society thinks, we're in big, big trouble. So I always talk about disruptive thinking. I like thinking of things differently, doing things differently. People look at me funny but I like to ask why many times. Some call this challenging the status quo. Some say it's innovative mindset. I just say it's progressive attitude. But the obstacle that I kept facing, and I know a lot of you will feel the same, and I can see a lot of you probably had a lot of ideas along the way, but didn't know what to do with it. So this obstacle that I kept facing was, what do you do with an idea? So you can have many ideas. Sometimes the best ideas you have in the shower, right? So you get all these ideas, but you don't do anything about it. So how do you convert an idea into a tangible product? How do you take it somewhere? So I realized back in 2013, and this is my story, we had to do something about it. So we decided to create a design and fabrication lab where people can just come with their ideas, 
and get help on converting them into a tangible product. We wanted to enable and inspire Sri Lankans, the entrepreneurs, the innovators, the inventors, into creating and imagining again. So to tell you a bit about how things were back in the day, there were things called late shops and foundries. They were not the most accessible, definitely didn't have the best customer service, and if you want to get something done, you had to go and get material from one place and go to these places, show them an object that is very similar to what you want, and then get it done. And you had to spend a lot of time there to get it done. So what we wanted to do was do things differently. We wanted to create a very easily accessible space where people with an idea can sit at home, relax, sit in their pajamas, send a WhatsApp message even, and start doing something with that idea. So make it very accessible. We want to offer great customer service. And we also wanted to use the latest technology. We wanted to use 3D printing with the latest types of materials and also be able to offer speed. So this is a picture of the lab that we started up in 2013. It looks very different now. And the most important thing was we wanted to make it affordable. Now, I take a step back just to explain this. It was very important for us to localize this idea. We wanted to apply it to Sri Lankans. So we handpicked the technology, handpicked the machinery, handpicked the materials, and we wanted it to be affordable for students. Because if it wasn't affordable for students, what's the point of doing all this? So the funniest thing happened. Over the last couple of years, we saw a significant change in mindset. In 2014, people used to come and give me a product and say, can you duplicate this? Now, they're still in that mindset that I need to show something just to duplicate it. 2015, people came with an object, but this time they were like, I don't really want this one, but I want you to change it. I want you to add something, or I want to remove something, and I want to slightly change it. So we call this incremental value addition. And 2016, I was really happy because I saw people walking in with only their brains, and they said, I have an idea, and I think it's going to solve a major problem. And I get really happy because I start seeing now there's creativity, there's innovation. So I'd like to tell you some of my favorite stories. I'm sure you can relate to some of these pictures on the screen. Probably even makes you a bit hungry, right? So I'd like to talk about Amina. She runs and operates a frozen food manufacturing company. And she wants to make the perfect patties. Perfect patties, perfect shape, perfect amount of filling perfect teeth size, and she wanted to go away from manual patty making to automatic patty making. I mean, I don't hear things like this in my dreams, right? <laughs> so she came to us. She said, I've been having this problem, Nisanga. I've been trying to communicate with a supplier overseas. He doesn't understand patties, not like you do. <laughs> so I remembered understanding this requirement, and we were able to prototype for her. We made her some patty cutters. We were able to get that shape, not the very first time, but she was able to try and test, try and test the life of prototyping. And here she, she has her perfect patties now. Now she's talking to me about the perfect cutlet. <laughs> the second example is of Dr. Pial. Dr. Pial heads R&D for a glove manufacturing company. And his life was like this. He used to take 45 days to 60 days to make a glove mold. Now, if you look at your hands, each one's hand is different. If you look to the left and look to the right and look at your hands, each one's hand is different. So Dr. Piel and I, we could talk for hours and hours on end on how the hands are different and what it means. So for him, for him to make a glove, he has to figure out the different types of hands. So he used to take almost two months to make a mold to try and test one of his designs. So with us, he was able to create up to five to 10 designs a week. So he was able to do so many designs, so many design iterations, 
and he was able to get to his final product really fast. Now the third example is of a lady called Charlene. Charlene is what I call a disruptive fashion designer. She always wants to know what is the latest materials available, what is the latest technology available. She wanted to know whether she can use Kevlar, whether she can use carbon fiber. I'm like, what are you making for whom? So she came to us and she said, Nisanga, I've been asked to make a wedding dress. I want to do it differently. So here I am making a 3D printed wedding dress. And it's very interesting. And she put herself onto the global map. Her, wedding, her 3D printed wedding dress got featured on the UK Business Times and put Sri Lanka really out there. So now Sri Lanka is known as the place where the first world's first 3D printed wedding dress came from. Now, a personal favorite story of mine is of this eight-year-old girl who walked in. She was born without fingers on one hand. And her parents wanted us to 3D print a prosthetic hand for her. <clears throat> she had gone to all the hospitals, and all of them had said, sorry, she is too small for our hands. Let me repeat that. She is too small for our hands. And I said, no, 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 no. That's not how it should be done. Let's custom 3D print for her hand. And we did it. Our team 3D scanned her hand and 3D printed a prosthetic hand for her. Today, she can pick and hold an object using that hand. She takes it for handwork class in school. And her father tells me she even rides a bicycle back at home. So why am I sharing all these stories with you? What's the, the big idea I'm trying to get at? Is that all these ideas and all these people were enabled, and they were able to take their idea somewhere. And they have great potential. These ideas could get patented, and it could bring potential revenue into the country. Now here's a thought. Perhaps Sri Lanka shouldn't only be limited to its coconut, rubber, tea, apparel, cinnamon, if I put it in there. Perhaps we should be known for our great ideas. So Bloomberg released this article recently about the most innovative countries. And they used these indicators, which was uh, number of patents, uh, number of research personnel, tertiary education available, number of R&D spending, uh, number of manufacturing companies, number of high-tech companies. So let's, let's don't look at that too much, but it just shows South Korea number one, Japan number two, Germany number three. But what's important is let's talk about patents. Um, and if you just look at international patents, um, it was very important to compare Sri Lanka versus South Korea, who's number one. I know you've seen the next slide, so I'll just go into it. Um, Sri Lanka last year filed for two international patents, whereas South Korea, namely one company, Samsung, filed for 6,000. Actually, they fought for 6,000 patents. So now you can see these two big numbers, and you start wondering, OK, wow, Sri Lanka is not too good, and South Korea is amazing. But it's important to understand the importance of patents. So what does a patent mean? A patent is actually an attempt at protecting an original idea, an idea that has potential to bring business revenue. So now it should make more sense why it is very concerning that Sri Lanka only filed for two international patents, whereas South Korea has fought for 6,000. So we wanted to understand South Korea a bit more. This is a typical Sri Lankan mindset. We wanted to figure out if someone's doing well, let's figure out what they're doing. Okay? So we started analyzing Japan and South Korea. And we wanted to see, okay, where are we different? Uh, obviously, their GDP is completely off. We can't match up with that. Their GDP growth rate is different. But we started seeing education, primary education, secondary education, all are roughly the same. So we are spending the same amount of time in school, but something is going wrong. Hey, something's going wrong. So then we started digging deeper, and one of the things that they were doing, I mean, out of the many things that, that they were doing right, one of the things that they were doing was setting up design and fabrication labs. This is really mind-boggling. They were setting up design and fabrication labs that they called innovation centers, 
and they've set up 25 already, where the youngest kid who can walk into these innovation centers and learn coding, learn about the technologies. And not only kids, I mean any age group, anyone can walk in and learn about what's out there, which will help them co-create, collaborate, and even create and take their ideas to the next stage. So I say to the government, ICTA, universities, private institutions, public institutions, and the public, if a small design and fabrication lab, such as ourselves, could have a positive impact on society and enable them to take the idea somewhere, imagine what we can all achieve together. Thank you very much.